This is the last lecture on groundwater hydraulics. Let us now describe the hydrological flow processes for a well in a regional groundwater flow field. For this, we will use the Dupuis equation that was introduced in the preceding lecture. T in the equation, of course, is the aquifer's transmissivity in square meter per day. When using this equation for an unconfined aquifer, the absolute value of the drawdown, h minus h large r, needs to be much smaller than the hydraulic head h itself. In practice, the Dupuis equation is often used for unconfined aquifers, as the error involved in deviating from the equation for steady groundwater flow in an unconfined aquifer, that we know as h squared equals h large r squared, etc., usually is not that large. For instance, see the outcome of exercise 3.15.4.4. Also, one should be aware that the estimation of the pumping well's radius of influence, large r, is more crucial, as is the error in estimating the aquifer's hydraulic conductivity or transmissivity. This figure shows the potentiometric surface, the pumping cone or drawdown curve, in Dutch afpompingskegel of onttrekkingskegel, due to groundwater extraction by a pumping well in cross-section view. Figure A, in the absence of a regional groundwater flow field, and figure C, in a regional groundwater flow field. As in all earlier derivations, for an unconfined aquifer, the dupuis forheimer assumptions apply. Figure B shows the potentiometric surface of the regional groundwater flow field itself. Please note that the curve of C is obtained by summation of the curves for A and B. Figure B shows the potentiometric surface of a regional groundwater flow field in cross-section. The groundwater in the regional field flows from right to left in the direction of the lower hydraulic head. The shape of the potentiometric surface of a regional unconfined groundwater flow system in cross-section is parabolic. However, the parabola is quite flat and, as the dupuis forheimer assumptions apply, we may simply approximate its shape as a linear function with the hydraulic gradient I as slope and C as a constant. We may assume the hydraulic gradient I for unconfined groundwater flow to be in the order of one thousandth. A positive gradient here as flow is to the left. Thus, for both confined and unconfined conditions, this equation holds. Hx is the hydraulic head of the original regional groundwater flow field in meter. Taking x is zero and r is zero at the same location, x and r in these equations are interchangeable. Figure C thus shows the drawdown curve of a pumping well in a regional groundwater flow field. Note that the volume fluxes of the pumping well in figures A and C are taken equal. The influence of the regional groundwater flow field in figure C is to lower the hydraulic head of the pumping well drawdown curve in the direction of the original regional groundwater flow. Physically, the hydraulic head H total in the drawdown curve of figure C is constructed by summation of the influences of the pumping well, figure A, and regional groundwater flow field, figure B. Thus, graphically, as mentioned before, the hydraulic head H total in figure C is derived by adding together H small r of figure A and Hx of figure B. Mathematically, H total is the summation of h small r, the Dupuis equation, and the equation for hx as shown here. So we get 
this equation. H total is the hydraulic head caused by pumping in a regional groundwater flow field in meters. At a certain point to the left in figure C, the hydraulic head ceases to be influenced by flow to the pumping well located to the right. The regional groundwater flow is to the left, and thus exactly at the point where flow to the right to the pumping well is replaced by regional groundwater flow to the left, we must encounter a point of no groundwater flow. This point is called the stagnation point. The stagnation point is a local maximum in the potentiometric surface H total, and mathematically, the local maximum can be derived as dH total dr equals zero. Here we have the equation for H total. This term with large r in it is a constant. This is also a constant. And when we differentiate this and set it equal to zero, this is what we get. And we can rewrite this to obtain r as a function of the pumping volume flux, the aquifer's transmissivity, and the hydraulic gradient of the regional groundwater flow field. This small r is negative for a pumping well in a regional groundwater flow field from right to left, with a positive hydraulic gradient, as in figure B and C. This is correct, as the stagnation point then is located to the left of the center of the pumping well, where small r equals zero. Do not learn this equation, 3.102 in my book, by heart. Instead, you need to be able to deduce this equation by being able to reproduce what has just been explained. This figure shows the plan view of the streamlines to a pumping well in a regional groundwater flow field in dark blue color and the regional groundwater flow field in light blue color. Note the position of the stagnation point in this figure. Please note that stagnation is not limited to this point, but that there is a stagnation curve in between the regional groundwater flow and the groundwater flow to the well. Etc. Good use can be made of a recharge well and pumping well to hydrologically isolate and treat polluted subsoil, a process generally known as pump and treat. This figure shows pump and treat the hydrological isolation of polluted subsoil by a pumping well indicated with a small circle with discharge Q1 to the left and a recharge well here to the right with recharge Q2. Importantly, Q1 equals minus Q2. The left part of this figure is equivalent to the plan view of a well in a regional groundwater flow field that we just saw. It thus shows streamlines in a regional groundwater flow field as influenced by pumping well Q1. If the subsoil to the right of the pumping well is polluted, the polluted water can be drawn to the pumping well and treated, after which cleaned water is injected, recharged upstream. When the injection rate Q2 of well 2 is taken equal to the pumping rate Q1 of well 1, thus Q1 equals minus Q2, and with the right setup concerning the distance between the wells and the actual pumping rate Q1, the polluted area is captured in a symmetrical water lens isolated from the regional groundwater flow system as evident from the streamlines given in dark color. Because of the continued pumping and recharge, the subsoil will get cleaner and cleaner still with the passing of time. As mentioned before, this hydrological isolation is an example of a technique 
more generally called pump and treat. Hydrological isolation of polluted subsoil is a very cost-effective measure as costs of pumping and injection or recharge are very low, especially when compared to measures such as excavation and or isolation of polluted soil by clay dams or concrete structures. A major threat to the production of drinking water in industrial countries is caused by the subsoil presence of trichloroethylene. Trichloroethylene, abbreviated to TCE, in Dutch abbreviated to TRI, is a chlorinated hydrocarbon commonly used as an industrial solvent. TCE is a co-carcinogen substance acting together with other substances to promote the formation of tumors. It cannot easily be removed from the subsoil. Since TCE is heavier than water and has a low solubility value, it is classified as a apple, a dense non-aqueous phase liquid. A apple will tend to sink through the groundwater column until it encounters an impermeable layer in the subsurface. When the impermeable layer is tilted, as for instance in an ice pushed ridge, the DNA apple will sink further along the dip of this impermeable material, independent of the direction of the groundwater flow, thus not necessarily with the groundwater flow. In lawsuits with respect to who is responsible for polluting the subsoil with TCE or another DNA apple, this should be taken into account. What should a drinking water authority do when in a field of pumping wells TCE is found in the pumped water from one of the wells? Shut down that well? No, surely not. What a drinking water authority should do is continue, even increase the pumping discharge of this well, and by this try to draw all subsurface polluted groundwater to this one contaminated well. Of course, do not use the pumped up water from this well as drinking water anymore, and keep a thorough check on the groundwater quality of the other wells in the field. Investigate the geographical spread of the TCE pollution in the subsurface and take all necessary mitigation measures. Groundwater can be polluted with nitrate from farming activities. In the Netherlands, this led to high nitrate concentrations in the upper groundwater. Here we have concentrations, here we have the Netherlands, and you see for this part of the Netherlands quite high values from 50 to 150 milligram per liter in the upper groundwater. However, in the lower groundwater, nitrate levels are low. This has to do with the occurrence of pyrite, iron sulfide deeper down in the subsurface. The sulfur in pyrite oxidizes to sulfate. This oxidation is not by oxygen, which is not present deeper down in the subsurface, but by the nitrate in the groundwater. This so-called anoxic oxidation of pyrite by nitrate results in the release of sulfate. In this way, nitrate and sulfate in the groundwater effectively cancel each other out. Arsenic occurs as a coupled substitution in the pyrite structure. Toxic levels of naturally occurring arsenic in groundwater for use as drinking water are a major threat to more than 100 million people worldwide mainly in South and Southeast Asia, dramatically raising their risk for cancer and other serious diseases. High levels of arsenic can be found in drinking water from deep drilled wells, which is particularly true for Bangladesh. The left figure shows these high levels for Bangladesh. As a reference, the US Environmental Protection Agency sets an arsenic maximum contaminant level for public water supplies at 10 micrograms per liter. This figure shows concentrations over 10 micrograms per liter for large parts of Bangladesh. 
with even values over 300 microgram per liter. As you can see to the right, the sustainable treatment of arsenic contaminated groundwater by a removal technique called electrocoagulation has been the topic of a Friday evening science talk, FEST, by Dr. Kees van Genuchte at our Faculty of Geosciences, Utrecht University. Hopefully, these talks can be resumed after our current COVID-19 pandemic in the not too distant future. Students, please then visit these most informative science talks. This figure shows the plan view of a pizzometer and a well field consisting of four pumping wells in a flat area. Each well has its own volume flux or discharge Q and circle of influence large R. The drawdown at distances small r from a specific well can be calculated by inserting the right values for Q, small r and large r in the Dupuis equation. We may rewrite the Dupuis equation as shown here. S is the drawdown H minus H large r. Remember, a pumping well has a positive discharge and a recharge well has a negative discharge. Therefore, S is a negative number for a pumping well and a positive number for a recharge well. There is no regional groundwater flow. The piezometer measures the hydraulic head as influenced by all four pumping wells. The principle of superposition applies, that is, the total drawdown, S total in meters, at any location within the circles of influence of the wells can be calculated as the sum of the drawdowns of each well. Thus, S total equals S1 plus S2 plus S3 plus S4. If the location of the piezometer lies outside the area of influence of a specific well, then of course there is no drawdown effect from this specific well discernible at the location of the piezometer. Probably needless to say that in case of a recharge well in this well field, its contribution is not a lowering of the hydraulic head, but an increase of the hydraulic head and that its contribution should be treated accordingly. In this figure, there are four pumping wells and the hydraulic head H in the piezometer after steady conditions have set in can be found by summation of the pre-pumping hydraulic head H large R and the total drawdown S total at the location of the piezometer. This figure shows streamlines in plan view and the potentiometric surface in cross-section for a recharge well and pumping well, a recharge well and pumping well, let us decide from west to east. There is no regional groundwater flow and the total drawdown as total can, similar to the procedure just outlined, be established by adding together S1 caused by the recharge well, S1 is positive, and S2 caused by the pumping well, S2 is negative. Interestingly, this causes a constant hydraulic head equal to the pre-pumping hydraulic head H large R exactly at the midpoint between both wells, as can be seen in this cross-section. From the plan view, it is clear that this midpoint is part of a line with a constant hydraulic head equal to the pre-pumping hydraulic head H large R, and that this line extends in a north-south direction perpendicular to the cross-section. Now imagine a situation with a pumping well and to the left west of it open water, a lake or canal, with a straight right eastern boundary 
coinciding with the line with constant hydraulic head H large R just mentioned. In reality, as the open water and groundwater meet at this straight boundary, and because the open water is continuously replenished from upstream, the water level at the open water boundary would remain at this constant level H large R all the time before pumping and also after pumping commenced. In fact, if one had wanted to insert an open water linear boundary in one's groundwater flow model with a constant hydraulic head H large R to the left or west of the pumping well, mirroring the pumping well, To the other side of the open water linear boundary, converting it into a recharge well with the same absolute volume flux, thus Q1 equals minus Q2, and then adding S1 and S2 together to give S total would just have been the way to go about it. The mirrored well is called an image well. In reality, this well does not exist, but is solely incorporated into the model for the wanted effect of creating an open water linear boundary with constant hydraulic head H large R to the left or west of the pumping well. The part of the model that exists in reality is the part to the right, to the east of this open water linear boundary. A known constant hydraulic head at the boundary of a water flow region is called a Dirichlet boundary condition after German mathematician Johann Peter Gustav Lejeune Dirichlet. An image well in Dutch is called a Spiegelput. If now we have a piezometer located at XY, a pumping well indicated as a real well here, and a river modeled as a open water linear boundary with to the left or west of it water, then we can determine the drawdown at the piezometer by using the principle of superposition. We add together the drawdown due to the real pumping well at R1 and the increase in hydraulic head due to the image recharge well at R2 to determine the real drawdown at the location of the piezometer with a real pumping well and a real river border near to it. Pumping groundwater from a sandy aquifer bordering a river, the situation just modeled, to provide for drinking water has as major advantages that the groundwater is abundantly replenished from its connection with the surface water, plus that the surface water contribution that moves its groundwater through the sandy subsoil, if this takes as a rule of thumb at least some 60 days, is biologically purified and freed from disease-causing microorganisms. Pumping groundwater from an aquifer bordering a river is a technique much used alongside major rivers in Germany. Similarly, this figure shows streamlines in plan view and the potentiometric surface in cross section west east again between two wells. But now both wells are pumping wells that have equal volume fluxes or discharges, thus Q1 equals Q2. It is clear from the cross section that this setup creates a flat potentiometric surface at the midpoint and midline between both wells. This flat potentiometric surface is obtained by adding this surface and this surface together. A flat potentiometric surface means no hydraulic gradient and thus no groundwater flow at the midline between both wells, and thus the creation of a no-flow linear boundary. 
A known constant volume flux at the boundary of a water flow region is called a Neumann boundary condition, after German mathematician Karl Gottfried Neumann. Thus, in this particular case, the Neumann boundary condition is a constant volume flux of zero. This figure summarizes how to calculate the drawdown at a location in the vicinity of a pumping well near A, an open water linear boundary, and B, a no-flow linear boundary, an impermeable area. One should first mirror the pumping well, indicated with a small circle, as just explained, calculate the drawdown negative value using the distance R2 to the pumping well, then calculate the drawdown positive or negative using the distance R1 to the image well. Here the image well is indicated with a cross, it's a recharge well, and here with a circular symbol, it's a pumping well. And then, of course, apply the principle of superposition by adding these two drawdowns together to give the total drawdown S total. Had the original or real well been a recharge well instead of a pumping well, then modeling an open water linear boundary would have involved the creation of an image pumping well, and modeling a no-flow linear boundary would then have involved the creation of an image recharge well. Exercises 3.15.5.2 and 3.15.5.3 .3 provide some training in the principles just outlined. All analytical equations derived thus far are based on simplifying assumptions. For instance, the dupuis forheimer assumption of horizontal groundwater flow in an unconfined aquifer. Canals, in reality, may not be fully penetrating, and streamlines in an unconfined aquifer are not horizontal, but slightly bent, slightly longer, and contracting near the canal, causing an extra flow resistance. Also, the canals may, for instance, be lined with less permeable material, also causing an extra resistance leading to a seepage phase, which is a steeper hydraulic gradient near the outflow boundary of an aquifer to open water. To account for deviations from reality, an extra resistance, omega, may be built into the Darcy or Laplacian equation. As an example, here we have the equation from table 3.3, our starting point of the exercises, for steady groundwater flow in a recharged, unconfined aquifer as shown here. Remember, C in this equation can be found by inserting the boundary conditions. First insert the X is zero mid boundary condition, and then the right X is L boundary condition. This gives the second equation, which can, for a polder landscape, if so desired, be rewritten to produce this optimal drain spacing 2L between two ditches. If need be, we can build an extra resistance into this second equation. Note that L squared divided by double the transmissivity carries as units meter squared divided by meter squared per day, thus days as a unit, a unit of resistance. Simply add an extra resistance omega to this, with the same units, of course, units of days, to account for the just discussed deviations of our models from reality that is, what we measure or observe in the field. Table 3.3 summarizes the equations for the different potentiometric surfaces needed to solve the exercises of this section 3.15. The equations for the potentiometric surfaces are derived after combining Darcy's law and continuity for steady groundwater flow in a homogeneous and isotropic medium, usually from Laplacians such as this one for confined aquifers or this one 
for unconfined aquifers. When we integrate this second derivative, we get dh dx equals c1. And when we integrate this again, we get this equation, h equals c1x plus c2 for confined aquifers. Same for unconfined aquifers. When we integrate this second derivative, we get dh squared dx equals c1. And when we integrate that yet another time, we get h squared equals c1x plus c2. These two equations at the top for a confined aquifer and for an unconfined aquifer are special cases of the three dimensional partial differential equation for steady groundwater flow in a homogeneous and isotropic medium known as the Laplace equation after Pierre Simon Marquis de Laplace. Note that the Laplace equation deals with three perpendicular directions x, y, and z. Analytical equations have been established for both stationary groundwater flow cases and non-stationary groundwater flow cases. Non-stationary is also called transient. Examples of transient groundwater flow are when pumping starts or ends, or when an open water level is suddenly lowered or raised, thus when there is no steady state. For instance, the general flow equation for radial symmetric unconfined groundwater flow in a homogeneous and isotropic medium is the Boussinesque equation. The Boussinesque equation, a linearized form is shown here, includes both the change of hydraulic head in time, dh dt, and sy, the specific yield. The specific yield is a measure of the volume of water per volume of porous material released by the forces of gravity in response to a decline of the water table. The scientific meeting center for hydrologists in the Netherlands is the Boussinesque Center. The center is also thus named after Joseph Valentin Boussinesque, a French mathematician and physicist. As an introduction to analytical groundwater hydrology or groundwater hydraulics, the seven equations of Table 3.3 will suffice. Importantly, analytical solutions to groundwater flow problems are especially useful to trained hydrologists as they provide a quick first estimate to many groundwater flow problems. For conceptually complex hydrological problems, more complex mathematical models are needed, and for this hydrologists use numerical computational methods that run on a computer. Different types of numerical approaches can be distinguished, that use finite differences, finite volumes, finite elements, or analytical elements. Whatever the specific approach, all numerical approaches have in common that they are based on combining Darcy's law and continuity. Just to pick out one much used modeling approach, the finite difference method, sometimes abbreviated to FDM, partitions the groundwater flow domain of interest into a grid of rectangular blocks and for each block solves the finite difference equations based on Darcy's law and continuity. Finite difference equations relate each node in a grid to the hydraulic head of its neighboring nodes and, in transient calculations, to the hydraulic head at the node at the previous time step. A well-known example of a finite difference modeling code is ModFlow, the modular three-dimensional finite difference groundwater flow model which is a United States Geological Survey, USGS, public domain modeling code. This picture shows output from the Brabant model, a groundwater flow model developed at TNO in the Netherlands, based on a finite volume numerical modeling approach. The output shown is of the Dutch province of North Brabant, 
within red colors the higher infiltration areas and in blue colors the lower areas with upward seepage. Interesting as it may be, it lies outside the scope of these lecture series to further introduce numerical modeling methods. For anyone starting off with hydrology, it's my hope that from studying my book and attending these lecture series, you have already gained some valuable insight into the workings of two most basic and essential hydrological equations, the flow equation, or Darcy's law, and the continuity equation, or water balance. The next lecture is on soil water, where we can make good use of pretty much the same major principles as for groundwater, be it that the description of water flow above the water table is slightly more complicated by the porous medium usually containing both water and air. Study well 